But she handles it always with that question. Always. She's got the key to figure that out. She has got that down to the way where it goes up. She's the opposite of I am. And then I gave her the hello. Who I met. I actually uh, had a nice chat with her once. Uh, and she, do, you, do you know Gravel at all? Oh, she always used to do it. Like, she used to do it. She used to support her. She helped them do it. Please have everyone take their seats. We're going to get started here in just a moment. All right, well, welcome, everybody. I first wanted to thank all of you for being here and helping make this event successful. You know, we do these things for you, the students, to bring you different points of view and to give representation to those conservative voices that all too often are silenced on college campuses like these. I also wanted to extend a special thank you to Young America's Foundation and their generous donors for helping us put this event on, as well as Dr. Kimberly Johnson and Trinity Wersta for their hard, hard work making this event possible. Let me tell you, they put up over 100 flyers on this campus, and nearly every single one of them was torn down. They didn't give up, so uh, can we get a big round of applause for them, please? <laughs> Now, for me to say that we're in for a treat tonight is a little bit of an understatement. I would go so far as to say that tonight is a historic night for Lock Haven University. In just a few short minutes, or rather seconds, I'll have the pleasure of introducing to you a man who has accomplished more in his short life than many of us will in our entire lives. This is a man who has fought endlessly to get sovereignty back to his nation and free it from under the thumb of the unelected, centralized bureaucracy known as the European Union. Now, before we begin, I wanted to highlight just a few of Mr. Farage's notable achievements. Frankly, if I had to name all of them, we would be here all night. And I know you guys are really excited for me to shut up so we can talk. Uh, Mr. Farage is not only a politician, being a member of the European Parliament, but is also a journalist, an activist, a political analyst, and a former entrepreneur. <laughs> Although he's best known for his work in the European Parliament and is a, a two-time leader of the UK Independence Party, Mr. Farage is also the host of the Nigel Farage Show on LBC, he is the co-chair of the Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy Group. He is also a, an advocate for individual rights, national <coughs> sovereignty, and the rule of law. Now, for his efforts, Mr. Farage has been called dangerous by media outlets <coughs> such as The Guardian, and has slogged through countless insults, hit pieces, and attacks on his character. Through it all, however, Mr. Farage never stopped fighting to restore sovereignty to the United Kingdom. So tonight, Young Americans for Liberty and Young America's Foundation are very proud to present to you for the very first time at Lock Haven University, Nigel Farage. Well, thank you for that, and good evening, Lock Haven. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to say to all of you, uh, particularly the younger members of the audience, you know, you are living through a really extraordinary and astonishing time in democracy and politics across the Western world. We have had a series of seismic shocks over the last few years, and it all started on June the 23rd, 2016, when the United Kingdom had a referendum on whether we should leave the European Union or remain a member. And the entirety of the global elite lined up to tell us 
and we must vote to remain. If we didn't vote to remain, terrible things would happen to us. Indeed, President Obama flew in specially to look down his nose and sneer at your greatest ally and friend in the world and to tell us that if we went for Brexit, we would go to the back of the line. We were told half a million jobs would go immediately, foreign investment would flee, the country's growth would collapse, taxes would rise, plagues of black locusts would descend, well not quite. <laughs> but despite all of it, we said the hell with it, we're going to vote to leave the European Union. And then a few short months later, something equally remarkable and unpredictable happened in, yes, the United States of America, where a real estate guy from Queens, fairly outspoken individual, not especially politically correct, called Donald J. Trump. And you know, that morning, when the New York Times and the Huffington Post said there was a 98.1% chance that Hillary Clinton would win the election, and hey, through the middle came Trump, and of course, Pennsylvania being one of the most important moments of that election night. He stunned everybody. And then, a year later, we had the elections in Italy, where a political party that had been set up by the country's best-known stand-up comedian, well, it's very tough to tell who the comedians are these days, in fact, <laughs> and Beppe Grillo set up the Five Star Movement. They won the election, uh, and, and they joined into a coalition uh, with the Lega, uh, which had been around for 30 or 40 years, but under the quite dynamic new leadership of a guy called Matteo Salvini, and they were able to form a majority government in Italy. It's remarkable. Both of those parties, just a few years before, between them, couldn't have mustered more than 5 or 6% in the opinion polls, and suddenly they were over 50%. So they are the three great dramatic political events that have shocked, I think, in many ways, the Western world over the course of the last few years. And I am in a very fortunate position to speak about them because I'm the only person alive on Earth who has a stake in all three of those things. Uh, the first one, of course, is Brexit. And I was never, ever going to be a politician. Never had any ambitions to stand for office in any way at all. I was in business. I worked in the commodities business. I spent 20 years in that game working throughout all of that time for American companies. So, you know, we bought and sold copper and, well, we call it aluminium, but you call it aluminum, um, and lead and tin and zinc and nickel. And that's what I did. And I got motivated to get involved in politics because I felt something was going wrong. I felt that my country, uh, you know, an ancient country, a country that has had a continuous parliament since the year 1270, um, a country that has cherished democracy and liberty so very much uh, that indeed Westminster is known as the mother of parliaments, um, a country uh, that believes in democracy and the nation state so much that twice in the 20th century we went to war to defend the very principle of the independence of, to begin with, Belgium in the First World War and Poland in the Second. And I'll come back to those two world wars of the 20th century and why they matter so much to our debate today. So I dedicated nearly 25 years of my life to fighting for Brexit. And along the way, I, I kind of thought I might become known as the patron saint of lost causes because <laughs> you know, arguing we should not be part of this European club was very much a minority sport. You know, not many people thought it was relevant. Not many people believed it was pertinent. Uh, but I kept on battling away. Uh, and I guess, to a very large extent, you know, I am the godfather of Brexit, um, and my very lonely battle and campaign suddenly became a majority view. And I can't tell you, uh, just um, the, the photograph that you saw on the poster for this event, that was taken at about half past seven in the morning on the green outside Westminster. We'd just overturned the establishment, won this historic referendum, and I can't tell you just how happy joyous I felt on that morning. Three years on, the 
have another hit of a difficult thing, and we'll discuss that during the evening this evening. Um, and it was as a result of Brexit, as a result of this anti-establishment uh, campaign that won, that suddenly the Trump campaign, which was, if you remember, back in August 2016, the Trump campaign was in big trouble. You know, he was 12 to 14 points behind in the polls. Uh, they didn't quite seem to, want to know really what the central kernel of the campaign was, and Trump kind of worked it out for himself. He worked it out that if he could pick up and use Brexit and explain to people you know, living in flyover state America, and indeed in states like this, that actually if the little people were prepared to stand up and fight against the big vested interests, against the big money, against the big politics, in our case it was Brussels, in your case, or in Trump's case, it was the Washington Beltway, the swamp, and all that went with it, um, that perhaps a surprise victory could happen here too. And so I found myself, it was the end of August 2016, in Mississippi, and I'd been invited over to the governor of Mississippi, <coughs> and the plan was that I was gonna give a speech to about a thousand <coughs> Republican activists in Mississippi, um, and I was gonna explain to them that you know, actually if you go out and talk to people, maybe people who haven't voted you know, for 20 years, 30 years, maybe people who've never voted in their lives, that the idea you can change things, actually the democracy gets people up off their backside and out to vote. So I was happy to be at this dinner to give this speech and, and Trump was there with me. And after we'd done the event, I was really excited because down at the basketball stadium in Jackson, there were 18,000 Mississippians there waiting for Donald to go on stage. And I was really excited. I thought, wow, you know, just, just to witness this as an English person, it's gonna be really, really exciting. And the event was starting at 7.30. And at 7.20, Stephen Miller, who's now the speechwriter, came over to me and said, oh, Donald was really impressed uh, with what you had to say earlier on at the dinner. Uh, we'd like you to speak at the rally. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> with that, Trump comes over, puts his hand on my shoulder, G. Nigel, this is so good of you, so good of you. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on the stage and speak. <laughs> so there I am with about eight minutes notice, 18,000 Mississippians out there. I wasn't quite sure what they'd make of me, or indeed, maybe what I'd make of them. But I got up there, I did my bit, um, and then through the rest of the campaign, I came back to all the debates, and I was one of the talking heads on CNN and CNBC and Fox, um, and I really you know, put myself absolutely entirely behind the Trump campaign. So I'm the only person in the world that was directly involved in both of those campaigns, and I'm the only <coughs> Brit in history that has ever spoken at a presidential rally for either political party. So there's a bit of me uh, that feels quite American these days, I have to say, and I'm rather pleased and proud of that. <laughs> and on to Italy. So Matteo Salvini, his first day in elected politics was in 2004. He was elected to the European Parliament, um, and I was the leader of the group that Matteo was first in. And normally, you can spot young talent in life. You can say, you know what, that girl, that guy, they're going to the top. I thought Salvini was one of the most lazy and useless people I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he seemed to spend the whole day at lunch and chasing all the secretaries around the place. But then, I guess in Italy, that's kind of what they do. Um, I, I grossly underestimated Salvini's ability, uh, but I've known him through all these years. Um, indeed, I know Beppe Grillo and the Five Star Movement too. And the whole thing is known as populism. That's the word that's used, isn't it? Populism. And the word is used as a pejorative term, that somehow populism is ignorant. Populism uh, is nasty, narrow-minded. Uh, populism is effectively akin to uh, every ism you can think of. You know, populists are all homophobes. Populists are all racists. Populists are all these absolutely appalling, ghastly people, or that's what you believe if you've read the New York Times every morning or watch CNN, and indeed in my country, the same applies to The Guardian and the BBC. And I want to explain to you 
what populism really is and why it's happened. But to do so, I think it's really important to explain, particularly to an American audience, just how awful the first half of the 20th century was. Now I know that here in your town of Lock Haven, you understand your past. As I drove through your street today, I saw the posters up on the street, including many pictures uh, you know, of young men from this town who went off to Europe or went off to the Pacific in World War II. Uh, uh, you know, and you know the great contributions that America has made all over the world to liberty and democracy, and in nearly every case, standing side by side with the British. But just try to get some sense, some comprehension of the sheer awfulness that happened in Europe. To begin, it happened between 1914 and 1918. You know, a war in which 20 million people are killed. A war in which a further 40 million are either seriously wounded or maimed for the rest of their lives. You know, I'm old enough, I'm old enough to remember people who were still suffering the effects of gas on their lungs in the trenches. I'm old enough to remember men with tin legs and all the rest of it. Goodness knows what it would have been like 20, 30 years before I was born. And this sheer awfulness of the First World War and then we have a break of just 21 years, and the whole thing happens again. But it happens on an even bigger scale. You all know, of course, about the Holocaust, about six million Jewish people being obliterated, and many other minorities too. But perhaps you don't understand just what Germany looked like in 1945. These great ancient cities of Germany literally reduced to rubble. You know, war with no limits. Something truly awful had happened to the entire world, and it had started in Europe. It had started basically because the French and Germans just simply could not get on with each other. And after that war, it was decided by everybody, America particularly, that we had to find some way of making the countries of Europe closer to each other to respect each other, to find a better way forward. And of course, the idea that France and Germany should trade war with each other, the idea that France and Germany should be at peace with each other, the idea that students in France and Germany should be able to have exchanges. All of these things were absolutely the right and sensible things to do. The problem was that the theory behind the European Union project, and the theory that has shaped the entire globalist agenda ever since that day, and shapes it still, is that the real conclusion that was drawn by the intellectuals, and indeed by the politicians in that post-1945 period, was that it was the very existence of nation states that had led to extreme nationalism, that had led to militarism, that had led to expansionism, and that what actually needed to happen was that nation states needed to be abolished and replaced with new supranational structures. So the objective of the European Union is effectively to render all of those states part of a bigger bloc, and that that bigger bloc wouldn't be governed by elected politicians governed by a new superclass of highly intelligent and well-educated bureaucrats. That was the intention of the European project from day one. The problem was they never actually told anybody that was the plan. They sold it as being about trade. They sold it as being about cooperation. And indeed, the European Union, the United Nations, the World Bank, all of these structures that were created post-1945 were all done with the very best of intentions. Just indeed, as communism. In 1917, the Tsar gets brought down in Russia and replaced by a communist government. The aims of communism were to make the world a better, safer, fairer place. In fact, what they did was to create a monster, the 
put it ductily, 40 billion of its own people. The road to hell can be paved with good intentions. Populism, the Brexit vote, the Trump election, the new government in Italy are all now reactions against that post-1945 settlement that has effectively left many of us feeling we're not living in democratic nation states. You know, I fought, I fought so hard for Brexit because <coughs> I thought it was outrageous that 75% of the laws in my country weren't made by us the people through our parliament, but were made through the institutions of the European Union. I thought it was outrageous that the, the, the British passport had now been extended to another 400 million people that lived in the rest of Europe, any of whom could come and live and work and settle in my country. And I think the reality, folks, is this. You can have high-minded ideas like communism. You can have a high-minded idea like a new world order, a new form of global government. You can have these ideas, but they only work if people actually want them. And the evidence is people don't want them. The evidence is people want to live in countries. People want to have their own identity. People want to have their own flag. People want to be able to hire and fire those that make the laws under which they live. That is how mankind wishes to structure itself. And all of these three big events that I've talked about are the kickback against that loss of control, the kickback against that, against that loss of freedom. And I absolutely, absolutely reject and resent the insults that are thrown at those of us who believe the nation state is the right vehicle within which we should live and organize our affairs. It is not racist or xenophobic to say you should control your borders. It is correct and logical that any country should want to choose and make sure it's getting the right people coming into its community who will be able to assimilate and become part of society. Isn't that, isn't that really, when you, know, when you think about it, isn't that what's made America a great country? People leaving different parts of the world, coming to settle in the USA, and within a generation, within a generation, they're all bearing allegiance to the American flag. They're part of the American dream. They've integrated and assimilated in American society. And there are <laughs> just too many parts of Europe, too many parts of my country, where large migrations have led far from assimilation to actually bits of our cities being completely divided. You know, I could take you, I could take you to a town called Oldham in the north of England, where literally on one side of the street, everybody is white, and on the other side of the street, everybody is black, where the, you know, the twain never actually meet. There is no assimilation. Whole streets in Oldham of people who've lived in my country for over 30 years who don't speak a single word of the English language. These folks are divided societies. These are societies in which resentment builds and grows. So I utterly reject and resent the idea that somehow it's narrow, nationalistic, and nasty to think you should control your own borders. Now, I think in the case of, of Trump and in the case of Brexit, the astonishing thing is that the normal rules just now don't apply. And this is what I mean by that. Normally, in a democracy, whether you like the result of an election, whether you like the next president or the next prime minister or the result of a ballot measure, which happens in this country, whether you like the result of the election or not, you respect the result of the election because that is how democracy works. And you can say to yourself, I can't stand this Trump way. He's absolutely ghastly. But what you do in normal times is you campaign to make sure that in four years' time, he's replaced by somebody else. But actually what we've seen in both the 
case of Brexit and Trump, is we have seen this new global order, the one that I talked about being constructed post-1945, and now backed up, supported, and funded by big multinational businesses and one or two big banks. And they've decided that they don't accept the result of the Brexit referendum. They don't accept the legitimacy as Trump, of Trump as the president of the USA, and they're doing their damnedest to stop it from happening. I think the Mueller inquiry here was perhaps the classic example of that. Tens of millions of dollars, was it 450 days the inquiry went on for? Um, it led to some of the most irresponsible journalism, I don't call it journalism loosely, um, and accusations being thrown around. And I found myself in the middle of it all. According to the BBC, I was a person of interest to the FBI. <laughs> Indeed, The Guardian, a Sunday edition called The Observer, ran a big double-page spread, and in it was Vladimir Putin, Julian Assange, Steve Bannon, Donald Trump, and whose face was in the middle with interlinking arrows to all of them, yours truly. <laughs> yes, Hillary Clinton said on a public <laughs> stage that Nigel Farage is funded by the Russians. Endless stories in the newspapers that somehow I was on the verge of being arrested the next time I walked into any American airport. I mean, the whole sheer level of, of, of just, just frack, well, I'll tell you what it is. It's fake news, isn't it? That's what Donald calls it, and it's fake news. But literally, any attempt used to do down the legitimacy of anyone that's been involved in this populist revolt, anyone that's been involved in this idea that we need to get back to being democratic nation states. And what happens when Mueller comes out? No Russian collusion, and I was not the center of this international spider's web. I have to tell you, the day that story was published, <clears throat> I did bring up Steve Bannon. I said, Steve, have you seen this story? I mean, they're basically saying that I was running memory sticks <laughs> from the president to WikiLeaks. I, I mean, I said, Steve, you know, this is incredible. What the hell do you think I should do? And Steve said, nothing. He said, they think you're more important than you really are. <laughs> And in my country, it's manifest itself in a slightly different way. <clears throat> and it is that Tony Blair and John Major, our former prime ministers, um, many members of the House of Commons, a majority of the House of Lords, much of our press do not accept the result of the referendum. So much so, they've done their best to water it down. They've done their best to delay it. Uh, and they're doing their best to make us vote again. I mean, can you believe that? Can you believe that? I mean, this was, this referendum was the greatest democratic exercise in the history of our nation. A massive turnout, a record number of people voting. And far from it being close, it was a victory for the Leave side of a clear 4%, a clear 1.3 million votes. And we all knew what we were voting for. Indeed, the government put a leaflet into each of our households saying that if you vote to leave, you are leaving the union, you are leaving the single market, you are leaving the customs union. Namely, we were voting to become an independent, self-governing, democratic nation state, a normal country. We knew what that meant, and every single leading proponent of both the Remain camp and the Leave camp said that would be the consequence. And yet now, we get the great and the good. Sneering, saying that Brexit voters didn't really <coughs> understand what they were voting for. If somehow we are just thick and stupid, and perhaps we don't wash as much as they'd like us to. I mean, the sheer level of condescension is, I think, appalling, disgusting, anti-democratic, and now we find ourselves three years on, no closer to Brexit than we were. 
Our Prime Minister, who incidentally is the most useless Prime Minister and the most dishonest Prime Minister I've seen in my lifetime. There we are, I feel better for saying that, thank goodness. <laughs> if I rang up a former Cabinet Minister, I rang up a guy called Lord Heskett, um, and uh, the older generation might remember him, Formula One motor racing team back in the 70s, big character, and he went on to become, for seven years, a Cabinet Minister. Uh, and I, f I phoned up Heskett, I said, Alexander, I said, she is the worst Prime Minister we've had in our lifetime. He said, well, steady on, old boy. He said, there's a fair bit of competition out there, you know. <laughs> but on balance, he agreed with me. And she told us 108 times, she told us <coughs> we were leaving on the 29th of March. And that's what the legislation said. You see, we didn't just vote for Brexit once. We voted Brexit on the 23rd of June, 2016. But a year later, in a general election, the Labour and Conservative Party both promised us in their manifestos Vote for us, and we will honour the result, and Brexit will happen. And then a few months after that, nearly 500 MPs, by a massive majority, voted for what was called Article 50, the piece of legislation that enabled us to leave. And that said, and it was put into British law, that we were leaving at 11pm on the 29th of March, with or without an agreement. And yet when it came to it, she couldn't get her dreadful agreement through, thank goodness. But rather than leaving on WTO terms, and by the way, all the business we do with America is conducted on WTO terms, which is far from being a disaster, and yet we didn't. So they told us we'd leave on the 29th of March. We didn't. They told us we'd leave on the 12th of April. We didn't. They told us we'd leave latest for the 30th of June, and we're not going to. And now they tell us we'll leave on Halloween Day, the 31st of October. And I'm asking myself, trick or treating? <laughs> In fact, the Brexit date has got more dates than the average child's advent calendar. And as far as I'm concerned, <coughs> if we trust our political establishment, Brexit will never happen. Which is why, and I said at the start, that I am not a career politician. I was motivated to get involved in politics because I wanted to try and force this great democratic change. Over the course of the last couple of years, I've taken more of a backward step. I am still a member of the European Parliament, and I do go along every month and make my speeches. Some of you may have seen my speeches in the chamber there. I always like to think I make a positive and helpful contribution <laughs> when I'm there. I certainly enjoy the experience more than they do, I've got to tell you. Um, but I, I kind of stepped back for the last two years from national politics, and I've, and I've developed, you know, I've done more radio shows and come in and doing things like this, and I've had, to be honest with you, a much more enjoyable life not being in frontline politics. It's a pretty rough, tough place to be. And if you think your press is rough, you ain't seen nothing compared to the British tabloid press, who keep seeming to write alternative CVs about my life on a daily basis. But I, after 25 years of battling for my country to be free and independent, after 25 years of that, I am not just going to roll over and allow these dishonest politicians to take away Brexit without coming back for a fight. And that's why. Just over three and a half weeks ago, I founded a new political party. We're called the Brexit Party. We're going to be contesting the European elections on the 23rd of May. We shouldn't be, of course, because we should have left. But because we haven't left, we are. Um, and it is absolutely my intention to lead that party into those elections, to win those elections, and to put the fear of God back into our political class to make them start listening to us. You know, here in your country, through your constitution, you all understand that you, the people, are the masters and the politicians are the servants. And the problem with this new globalist model, the problem with the European Union, and the problem that British politicians now who have picked up this disease is they think that they are the masters. They think that we are the servants 
and on the 23rd of May, I'm going to give them the bloodiest nose they have ever seen in modern times. Believe me. <laughs> okay, well, what I've done, I've left loads and loads of room for questions, but not just questions, comments, thoughts, debate, because I'm keen to get an active debate going in the room. I hope what I said to you makes sense, but basically these structures were set up with the best of intentions, but they turned into something quite the opposite, I think in many ways, of what voters thought they were going to be. So I'm really, really keen to open this up to get some questions. Those lights are vicious, aren't they? Hi, I'm, sure there, I'm sure there are some people sitting there. There's a hand at the back there. Yes, sir. Is, is there a roving microphone? Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and open up the questions, which we have a few ground rules. If everyone who wants to ask a question can come around this side, around the back, and line up behind that pink line there, uh, we'll go ahead and have you answer uh, ask some questions. Uh, just a couple of rules. I'm going to hold the mic, uh, so I'll uh, hold it out in front of you so you can ask some questions. Uh, make sure they're actually questions. Uh, don't get up here and make a statement. Um, like I said, go around the back of the stage. Please do not come around the front, please. Um, and also, no follow-ups unless you were prompted. Okay, so if you go ahead and get lined up, we'll uh, have you ask your question. Here we go. Oh, also stand on the pink X. <laughs> Lock Haven Wrestling. Right, I've got to be careful here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, first I want to say thanks for coming out. Um, second, what is your opinion of the American executive versus the foreign nation? Our confidence versus the whole impeachment process and then also ask the second one. Yeah. Well, look, let's, let's start with that. Look, um, your system is different because yours is a presidential system. You know, and ours is not a presidential system. In our system, we vote for members of parliament, and the prime minister comes from among those members of parliament. And indeed, we can change prime ministers without the people ever being referred to. So there are pros and cons of both systems. In some ways, in some ways I like the American system because it's clear, it's beyond doubt when you vote that you're voting for a, for a president and a vice president who are for that term going to run the country. No confusion, no doubt about it. Uh, my, I do wonder whether when the founding fathers uh, put this system into place, with its series of checks and balances, whether they realized that actually they could finish up with most presidents halfway through their term, having completely lost control of Capitol Hill and the whole thing being gridlocked. And I do think there is a question about the way the American system works now, that it's almost become ungovernable. Virtually no president in the last two years of any elected term can actually pass any legislation at all. So I think, there's a, I think there is a, a real question to be asked there. In our system, um, look, I think our system is out of date. I think Britain needs bringing into the 21st century. Uh, we now live in an age, America still has two-party politics. Yeah, you've got the Libertarians and the Greens, but essentially, America is still two-party politics. Politics in Britain and Europe isn't. It's now fractured. It's much more around individual views, and I think our electoral system needs, needs bringing up to date. And our second chamber, I mean, you've got a Senate here as your second chamber. We have something called the House of Lords, which is now filled up with 700 of Tony Blair and David Cameron's mates who are made Lord X or Y and sit there and vote on legislation, having never been elected. And you can't even sack them, even if they go to prison. So I think British... British politics needs bringing into the 21st century. And to be honest with you, one of my aims with the Brexit party is not just to get Brexit delivered, but it's actually to change the system of government that existed in our country, because frankly, it's shown itself to be broken. It's just not working. I'll happily take one more if you want to ask it. Uh, is the, after Brexit happens, uh, is the goal to have more trade within the Commonwealth land yeah, well, after Brexit happens, let me just tell you something. You're going to be an almighty party, and you're welcome to come and join me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it, it'll go on for days, I promise you. <laughs> the, um, uh, look, I, I, when we joined what was called the common market, in those days, the European economy was about 30% of global GDP. Right? So the argument that you have a tariff-free, quota-free deal with a set of very big countries that are on your doorstep from an economic perspective is very logical. And indeed, my mum and dad both voted for staying part of the common market for those very reasons. Just if they'd known how political it would become, and my parents are both still alive, and I can tell you they both voted Brexit, but they, 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 they'd have crawled over broken glass to vote Brexit because they felt they were lied to first time round. But even if there was that economic argument that was strong of itself, then today, the Eurozone is 15% of global GDP, and next year, it'll be 14%. And the year after that, 13%. And within 10 years, it'll be between 5 and 8% of global GDP is inside Europe. Europe, uh, economically, is failing in a big, dramatic way. Uh, countries like Italy have sadly seen no growth for the last 20 years at all. The Euro has been a disaster for all those Mediterranean countries. Uh, and why would we want to inextricably link ourselves with, with one of the de declining blocks of the world when there's the Commonwealth and America? English-speaking countries, similar legal systems, similar contract law, countries that actually like us, when quite a lot of the Europeans don't particularly like us, it's got to be said. So yeah, the idea is Brexit is not protectionist, Brexit is not, in, is not inward looking, Brexit says we start to do more business with a wider group of countries across the world. And I'm very struck with America. You know, we are the biggest investor, biggest foreign investor in the USA is us. And the biggest overseas investor in my country is you guys. It's logical that you could bring down barriers and do more business together. Thank you very much. In fact, um, I'll come back to that point quickly, that point about the Euro. So the north and south of Europe pushed together inside the same economic and monetary union, and it's only worked for one country. For Germany, it's been fantastic. Germany have been the beneficiary of the Euro. Everybody else has paid the price. And you know, I talked about this idea that, that the European Union would make everyone closer together and friendlier with each other. Now it's led to incredible resentment between the north of Europe and the south of Europe. The north of Europe saying, why on earth are we bailing out these lazy Mediterraneans? And the Mediterraneans saying, why are the Germans telling us what we can and can't do? Real bad enmity. In fact, there's a little story, quickly, if I can, about a chap last week who flew into Athens, a German fella, and he got to passport control, gave his passport, to the, to the officer, the officer looked at it and said, uh, occupation, and the German said, no, I'm just here on holiday for a couple of weeks, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Bit slow, some of you, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hello, hi, uh, my name's Calvin Jacobson, and I drove here from um, Penn State Altoona to come hear you talk today. And a question I had was, you described the town um, as being like half divided with whites on one side of the street and um, poor other people on the other side of the street? I, I said black. White skin one side of the street, black the other side. Black, okay, yeah. thank you, thank and, you. And, and not sharing the same language. And I, and I think that's a bad thing. Okay, well, black, yes, black. Um, my question is, you know, with this kind of divide, how would you handle this situation humanely? For example, like on the United States, southern border with the division of uh, children and parents that's many argue not the most humane way to handle yeah the immigration situation so i was wondering in your opinion what's a humane way to handle that situation well let's let's deal with that and i, I know that president trump's taken some huge heat on that issue while all the people throwing their arms up in the air saying isn't it disgraceful what none of them are saying is the obama administration did the same thing, and we do the same thing. If a family is at, found illegally coming into Dover, our southern port, we separate the children and parents as a matter of course. 
And I do think that some of the criticisms of Trump, and, and I know the language he uses can be a bit strong at times, but some of the criticisms of Trump are frankly hypocritical, all right? Because actually other regimes behave the same way. My basic point is this. There is a difference, sir, between genuine refugees and those seeking to move for advantage. My family were refugees. My family were French Protestants who in the 1730s left France because as Protestants they were being burnt at the stake. I think actually if you ask Parliament at the moment what they'd like to do with you, that might come back as being quite a good idea <laughs> in some cases. Um, you know, if, if, if you go to the 1951 Geneva Convention that actually defines what a refugee is, and a refugee is a man or a woman, you know, who are in genuine fear of, of, of their liberty and their life because of their religion, because of their race, because of their orientation. That is what a genuine refugee is. And my country, my own country, has an unparalleled record in the world of helping refugees. We've done it with, in my case, the French Protestants. We've done it twice with big waves of, 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 of Jewish, uh, firstly from, from Russia, but secondly from, from, from Austria, and indeed from Germany too. We've done it with the Ugandan Asians, where they were threatened of being killed by that madman, Idi Amin. I, you know, I have not got a problem with helping genuine refugees, and I'm sure there are many in America who, who would say, let's help people in problem. But when you see a whole caravan of people headed for the US southern border, they may, they may well come from, from poorer circumstances than you living in this country. And you may, to some extent, feel sorry for them, but they don't qualify as refugees. And unless you put some limit, some strictures on it, uh, then, then frankly the problem won't end. So my heart is open to helping genuine refugees, but once immigration becomes a free-for-all, you've got a problem. And I'm gonna finish, so the long answer, I'm gonna finish this very quickly by saying this. We, in the United Kingdom, realized that we owed a huge, huge debt to the empire. 40% of all of our manpower and woman power in two world wars came from our colonies. They came from Canada, Australia, India, what we now know as Pakistan, you know, Jamaica, you name it. <clears throat> and it was felt post those two wars and, and with the beginning of independence being granted to those countries that we owed a great debt. And so began post-war Commonwealth immigration to Britain. And it started in 1948, and in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, for more than 50 years, net migration into, into the UK ran at about 30,000 a year. That was net migration <coughs> into the UK. And just after Tony Blair came to power, we had, without doubt, the best race relations, the best interfaith relations, the highest degree of integration of any country in Europe. We had handled this very, very well, and in a way we could be proud of. When it went from net 30,000 a year to net 300,000 a year, we could not even begin or attempt assimilation, and that is when these great divisions in our society occurred. And I do think how we handle this issue really, really matters. Sorry, long answer, but that's how I feel. I would just ask you, I want to know, uh, if you could just define the difference between uh, nationalism uh, and, and fascism, and how we in America can celebrate freedom and independence and, and, and being a sovereign state, as you say, without devolving into uh, Germany and 1940s independent or fascist state. No, it's a good question, key question. So whenever I'm asked, are you a nationalist, Mr. Farage, I say, no, I'm not a nationalist, I'm a nationist. I believe the nation state is the right and the essential building block. The attempt that is made by many on the left to equate nationism or nationalism with fascism or extremism uh, is, is, is clearly false in every single way. And, and it goes back, it goes right back to what they were thinking about France and Germany uh, in, in that, that post-1945 period that I've talked about so extensively tonight. 
they thought the existence of nation states is what led to nationalism, and is what led to military expansionism, and is what led to war. They actually got it wrong. And here's the point. It directly links to your question. Provided the nation state is a fully functioning democracy, it will not become fascist. It will not be militarily expansionist. And do you know something? And this is really interesting. There is not one single example of one functioning mature democracy going to war with another functioning democracy. So if we want, if we want to be people who support peace, if we want to be people who support good relations between neighboring countries, we should make sure that nation state democracy is strong, not surrender that democracy up the line to higher supranational authorities. And I feel very strongly about that. Uh, and, and it's just outrageous. You know, I mean, frankly, the real fascism these days, the real intolerance, isn't Matteo Salvini or Donald Trump. It's those on the left who wish to shout down the other side. And indeed, on campuses like this, across America and across the whole of the UK, attempt to no-platform speakers who've got ideas they don't like. That's the real modern fascism. We, we attempt to close down these things. <laughs> yes, John. Uh, what are the main ways to free Brexit Party and to actually achieve Brexit? Well, I, as somebody who's worked in business, and I've worked in commodities, I said American-owned firms, but I've actually bought and sold and shipped products all over the world. Uh, now look, you know, if you have to fill in a couple of customs forms, which these days, of course, is all done online, it's not the end of the world, but re generally, removing barriers to trade and removing bureaucracy uh, leaves more room for entrepreneurs to have ideas and do things and make money. And when you make money, you employ people. And when you employ people, you also pay taxes. So I'm all for making life easier for business. And you know something? For 25 years, I've said that I wanted us to leave the political structures of the European Union and to replace it with a genuine free trade agreement, which is what my mum and dad thought they were voting for all those years ago. <laughs> that would and could and should have been achievable. The reason being that we trade at a massive deficit with the European Union. So given that they're going into recession, given that unemployment's very high in many European countries, they need the UK market. I mean, one in three, one in three BMWs that is sold overseas is sold to the United Kingdom. Now, here's a figure for you. We import, the UK imports 110 million bottles of Italian Prosecco every single year. <laughs> That's what my daughter's generation drink on a Friday night out. Don't ask me why, but there we are. Um, so, you know, you know if, if you start to put tariff on Italian Prosecco, you start to put tariff on German motor cars, you know, they're going to pay effectively a bigger price for that than we are. So I've always wanted to have a free trade deal. However, we didn't really ask for it and the European Union never offered it. And if you're going into a negotiation, and anybody in this room that's ever worked in the private sector, has ever been in a, in a negotiation will know that when you go in, you, know, you, know, you and I meet, and we're talking about business we're doing, you need to know that if I'm not happy with what you say at this meeting, I'm walking out of that door and I'm taking my business with me. That is, that, that is how all business negotiations work. The Europeans always knew, they always knew that Mrs. May would never ever walk out of the door. So we were in this negotiation from a losing position, and I advocate now that we just simply leave. We leave on World Trade Organization terms. We leave not just the customs union and the single market, but the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. Can you imagine? If, if the Supreme Court in America 
with the overall bipolar in Mexico. I mean, you wouldn't put up with it in this country, and nor should you put up with it in this country. And so I now want us to leave on WTO terms, have a clean break, and do you know what will happen? Within a couple of weeks of us leaving, they will come on bended knee to us, saying, please, can we have a deal? And we'll say, well, you know, with time, I'm sure we can sort something out. It's all about having the upper hand in the negotiations. And by the way, by the way, I'm not anti-European, all right? I'm not. You know, I married a German woman. I've got two daughters who are bilingual and have got British and German passports. I've worked in the past for French companies. I've drank more Spanish wine than is good for me. I love Europe. I love Europe. But for those that haven't been, it's a fantastic continent. You drive 100 miles across Europe, you find different people, different languages, different cheeses. I mean, it is, it is a wonderful, diverse place. And provided Europe is made up of democratic sovereign states, working, trading, being friendly with each other, it will go on being a great continent. What I object to are those ancient nation states of Europe now being governed by Mr. Juncker and a bunch of bully boys who we can't vote for and we can't remove. And I'm, I'm way more radical, way more radical than just wanting the UK to leave the European Union. And one of the reasons they fear me so much in Brussels is I want Europe to leave the European Union. I want these structures brought down. I want the bureaucrats all fired, every 30,000 of them. You can see how popular I am when I'm there. Thank you. I think there's a, there's a libertarian question coming here. Right? I, I, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate, I guess. I heard some Remainers that would say that what, like, there was issues with the initial referendum. There was, there was possibly corruption on either side, and they're now calling for a second referendum. And they would say, why not? Like, what's, what's the issue if, if the Socialists are like the vote being not being different, why not just have a second referendum? How would you respond to that? Well, look, I mean, two things to say to that. Firstly, firstly, they've been lying for 50 years. They, li they lied to my mum and dad. They told them it's just a common market, when actually there was a political motivation all the way through. They've lied for 50 years. The worst that we did was Boris put you know, some numbers on the side of a bus that might have been a little bit too high. And, you know, and I've challenged on my LBC talk show, for the last two years, I have challenged any single caller, to, and, and I don't censor calls at all, unless they use bad language and push the delete button, but, but I've challenged anybody to say anything that I said in that referendum campaign that was a lie, and no one yet has. And here's the point about a second referendum. It is fundamentally undemocratic to make people vote again because you don't like the result until at least you've implemented the first one. If we implement the referendum, if in five years' time there's demand for another vote, there's demand to have a fresh rethink, that is fine because that's how democracy works. Democracy allows us to make decisions and then change our minds every four or five years. But to try and have a second referendum because they don't like the result, I think is one of the biggest insults ever put upon the people of this country, uh, of our country. I have to say, though, if it did come to it, I'm pretty certain of one thing, Leave would win by an even bigger majority. The problem is, if Leave did that, did that with this current parliament, they'd probably just ignore it again. And that's why we need the Brexit party. That's why I've got to try and win these elections on May the 23rd. They have got to start fearing the people again. When they fear the people enough, they'll get what we deserve. Okay, this next question will be our last one, unfortunately. Oh, are they getting bored? <laughs> I don't know about that. thoughts when you talk about, you know, that the, you, the EU makes laws without any consent from the citizens. So what are your thoughts on the UN? Yeah, look, I mean, again, 
The United Nations is one of these well-intentioned organizations, just indeed as the League of Nations was back in, you know, 1920, um, Look, I am all for, I am all for international organizations where countries get together as friends that respect each other and you can agree some positions. What I'm not for are international organizations that morph into supranational organizations and then give the ability to make decisions to those organizations. And I have to say there are aspects of the United Nations that are very similar to my friends in Brussels, uh, two higher salaries, all sorts of ludicrous appointments, despots all over the world getting roles in, in human rights and all the rest of it. And as I say, the principle of the UN is a good one. The practice of it at the moment is not a very good one. But the highlight for me of the United Nations in the last few years was Donald Trump's speech there that he gave last year. And when anybody ever asks you, what is the doctrine of Trump? I think he laid out in that speech at the UN everything that he, as a human being, believes. His belief in the nation state, his belief in the democratic process, his belief that bureaucrats, be they in the UN or the EU or elsewhere, should never get above their station. So let's watch the UN like a hawk. It could be a force for good. At the moment, it's a force for bureaucracy, high salaries, and it's costing us a bit too much money. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.